you for uh, joining us this afternoon and um, appreciate you taking your time to come in here. And um, what we'll do is uh, Brian and I will both introduce our a speaker, they'll get their three to five minute overview. And once everybody's been introduced and given their overview, um, Brian and I will start fielding questions. Um, so if you'll just put those into the chat as you go along, and if you already have questions from watching the presentations, go ahead and do that while we're doing the uh, overview section. But um, first off, I'd like to start with uh, Mark Frischer, who is um, a professor with the University of Georgia out at the Skidaway Institute, Institute of Oceanography. Um, he's a microbial ecologist whose interest involves understanding the inter interactions between microbes and larger organisms and systems, um, investigating microbial parasites and their hosts. And Mark has worked closely with Georgia Sea Grant um, ever since he was in graduate school, and, or I should say Sea Grant in general, and Georgia Sea Grant on Black Gill, I think since 2014. And with that, Mark, you got three to five minutes to give us an overview. All right, thank you, uh, Tom and Brian and Mona and everybody, all the organizers. I think we should change the title of this session to Jessica and Three Bald Men. Anyway, as, as uh, so a focus of our uh, current Sea Grant project, which has been going on, as Tom mentioned, or, uh, actually four cycles of Sea Grant funding, which I think is probably unprecedented, but very necessary. And we're very grateful for that extended time period that we can sort of dig into this sort of mystery of what causes shrimp black gill. Um, but despite all the, you know, the huge decline that the industry has seen, which is Georgia's most valuable economic uh, fishery, valuable, economically valuable fishery, which is shrimp, um, despite all the declines that have happened, it still uh, is that it has that status of being the most uh, economically valuable fishery. Um, and sorting out what what's going on with you know what the impact of any one thing on a fishery uh, is pretty tricky business, and I don't know that we ever can disentangle it. Um, so I and I don't know if there are any solutions at the end, and maybe I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here in talking, but. I think perhaps the most impactful and important uh, part of this project or outcome of this project is the role that I think it's been playing in bringing all the stakeholders in an industry together, the, fish, uh, the shrimp fishing industry in particular, um, the management, DNR, uh, the researchers, and then of course the fishers themselves. Uh, this has been, was a big problem, especially in the beginning of shrimp black gills that people were just weren't talking to each other, weren't sharing observations. And I think that's important in any fishery. And I think with respect to disease or parasites or a condition like black gill that we know isn't gonna go away. We also know it's not the only one. And that's not, you know, if another epidemic happens, it's just when. And having the kind of, creating the kind of transparency and, and integration between all the stakeholders is really gonna help us out with whatever comes down the road next. And we're sure that there's gonna be something that comes out. So just to recap a little bit uh, of the presentation, if you didn't get a chance to watch it, I really talked about four things, four, four sort of highlights. And that is the identification of the cause of black gill. Um, the idea or the evidence pointing to that what is the sort of underlying cause of why this emerged, where it came from. It's not a new or invasive kind of parasite, but it's probably always been with us or been with us for a very, very long time. But the environment has changed and that changes the interaction between the parasite and the shrimp and has caused the problem. So that's what we think all that evidence points to as environmental drivers as being the real cause of it. Um, talked a little bit about what we can do about it. We're never gonna get rid of shrimp black gill and the par parasite that causes it, the ciliate. Uh, but I think that we can adapt the fishery itself so that it's not quite as devastating as it, as it has been. And that comes from knowledge of being able to predict and make some forecasts that actually uh, are based on understanding that this is now in our system. Uh, and that has not been the case before. I mean, we've really had a a uh, hindcast kind of modeling management approach where this is how it happened for the last 50 years. So we think it'll happen that way for the next 50 years. And it, like so many other things, 
that just isn't the case. So too many things are changing and they're too unpredictable. So uh, understanding and integrating that into our understanding and models has been a big point, we're big push point on the project. Uh, and finally, I made a prediction. I've, these in-person meetings in the past, I have come and I've said that because we've made this correlation and this observation that the climate is involved and it's a winter temperature is really can predict or helpful for predicting the performance of the fall white shrimp fishery, which is the one that seems to be most impacted by black ill. Um, that, so that by using uh, data of the previous winter's temperature, water temperatures, we can make some predictions, at least grossly, uh, about uh, how the fishery is gonna perform in the fall. Uh, and so I like to make my prediction for next year, this coming up fall, that we're gonna have an average or slightly above average uh, fall harvest this year. So that's, I guess, a little bit of good news. Uh, and finally, just on that point is that these kind of models are so crude and what we really need is a mechanistic understanding of all of these interactions. And if we have those in place, those will greatly, I think, help us uh, with the resilience and sustainability of the shrimp fishery and probably all of our fisheries. And so with that, I'll stop. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate that overview. Um, next on our panel is um, John Carroll. And John is a marine ecologist at Georgia, Georgia Southern University. Um, he's interested in how shellfish interact with other species and their environment and how that impacts their populations and resilience. Um, his research seeks to bridge basic ecological theory and applied problems to better manage and restore shellfish populations. He completed his PhD work at Stony Brook University, where he focused on scallop restoration. And while at UNCW as a postdoc, he worked a lot on oyster restoration and aquaculture. And that love of oysters has carried down to his work here in Georgia as well. So with that, John, you got the floor. Uh, thanks, Tom. And thanks for everybody for um, joining the webinar today. So like Tom mentioned, I've been doing a lot of various uh, oyster projects in, uh, in Georgia since I got here about six years ago. And um, the, the work that I presented uh, on the video is, was a current Sea Grant that we're, we're in the middle of, so we're still collecting data, but that was focusing on uh, oyster diseases, oyster population genetics, and then the potential, um, some potential work on human pathogens as well. One of the things that that we sort of noticed um, when I was working in North Carolina with, with the shellfish hatchery there, uh, something that, that I had a student work on here in Georgia a few years ago, uh, was that these intertidal reefs we have in the Southeast actually um, seem to have very high prevalence of, of oyster diseases, uh, disease causing parasites um, that cause uh, MSX and dermo. In other parts of oyster, the oyster range, uh, farther north and on the Gulf Coast, these are, these are diseases that uh, lead to mass mortality events. So it's something that certainly is concerning uh, for oyster management and, and particularly for the growth of the aquaculture industry. So we are interested in sort of characterizing, you know, what's the, what's the prevalence and intensity of these diseases? Uh, is there something that can be linked to population genetics or something that could be linked to some pretty standard um, water quality? What we find is uh, essentially almost all the oysters have at least one or both of these diseases present when we use our uh, PCR assays. The good news is that the intensity is very low. So even though we can detect the presence of the diseases, it, it, uh, it becomes, it's, it's only detectable very late in the, in, the, in the PCR process, which means there's low intensity relative to the amount of oyster tissue that we're sampling. Uh, and right now, based on the, the sort of data that we've collected so far, um, we don't seem to see any adverse effects on oyster condition index, which is just the fatness of the oyster um, relative to the size of the oyster. Um, and so that's sort of good news, uh, and, and uh, except that there is some variability in, in where we find them. We've been sampling at uh, four creeks and in, in some of the recreational harvest areas. And so actually I've been working with uh, Jeb Byers at UGA uh, on some proposals to try to, try to sort of understand why we have some of that variability and disease prevalence uh, and intensity in some of these different areas. So, so hopefully we'll be able to keep working on that. Um, we do see in some creeks uh, a high level of relatedness. So oysters, uh, they have um, 
They have planktonic larvae that are in the water column for two to three weeks. And so there should, in theory, be a lot of mixing. But what we're finding in our creeks is a high degree of relatedness and fine scale population structure, which is sort of counterintuitive to a uh, sort of open uh, planktonic larval stage organism. So, so there's some stuff that we could follow up with there. And this summer, last summer, we didn't get to do it because of COVID and we got delayed and everything. But this summer, we're going to be looking at Vibrios and trying to link uh, fine temporal scale patterns in the presence of Vibrio to, uh, to some swamp station measurements at, at Sinir. Um, get when we get the oysters from Tom and working with uh, Rachel to um, put the oysters out uh, on Sapelo Island. Great. And Thanks, that, John. That's a summary. Thanks. <laughs> All right. So uh, after the first two, I'm excited to introduce Jessica Reichmuth. Uh, she is currently Associate Professor of Biological Sciences at Augusta University, um, has two BS degrees from Coastal Carolina, and her master's and PhD work is from Rutgers up in Jersey, uh, where she gained training in topics from uh, ex ex ecotoxicology, population genetics, and marine ecology. Um, also known as Dr. R, uh, from her students, uh, she teaches a variety of ecology-related courses um, and has led several successful uh, study uh, uh, broad courses as well. Um, and is, for any of you know that Jessica, she is very engaged with her undergraduate research students, which is amazing uh, work that she does uh, and has obviously led to successful uh, extramural funding and um, both at the local, regional, and national, uh, and international levels for that matter. But, um, and then she was also acknowledged as the Outstanding Young Faculty Member Award uh, for the College of Science and Mathematics uh, at Augusta University. And uh, was also most uh, recently recognized as the, um, from the school's Outstanding uh, Faculty Member. So it's great to see Jessica. I'm gonna turn it over to you and go ahead. Thanks for the invitation to talk a little about what we've been doing in, on the Satilla River. Um, if you listened to the presentation, um, there wasn't a lot of background on how we um, kind of fell into that project. Um, we happened to get a chance at a previous Sears meeting, which is the Southeastern Estuarine Research Society, um, to listen to some talks about um, some issues that a local community had in terms of shoaling in, on their, in their hunting property. Um, so uh, Clay Montague, who is an emeritus professor from University of Florida, you guys may know him. Um, um, we started talking and then came back. And so we've been, this is, this project has been successfully funded twice by coastal incentive grants for two year, um, pro, um, for two, two year um, um, sessions. And um, because I am a teaching faculty here at Augusta University, so most of the research that's carried out on this project are undergrads. Um, we had a rotating crew. If you guys, again, if you listen to the picture, you can see the selfies with the gar, <laughs> the gar and the sharks um, based, on, um, uh, based on a lot of the, our um, passive um, collection techniques. Um, so we have been in the Satilla River system working with the local landowners at Dover Bluff community since 2014. Um, it was, it off, offered a really unique opportunity to get a long-term observation data set for this, for this region. Um, and then uh, some contacts from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers um, contacted Clay, the Satilla River keeper at that time was Laura Early. Um, and we began this um, this project of monitoring um, flow conditions. The fish data that was presented in the um, presentation that you guys listened to, as I mentioned, is a, just a small subset of the data that was collected for this project. Um, we had uh, collaborators um, from Georgia Southern. John was actually um, a collaborator for oysters in the Satilla on this past um, CIG grant. Um, we did lots of stuff from fish to water quality um, uh, crustaceans like white shrimp and blue crabs. Um, we've done some population genetics. We've done soil micro, uh, microbiology, um, but the fish, the fish data is um, just a small subsection. Um, our goal was since we had started communicating some of our data with the Corps of Engineers, the Savannah District Office, that they'd be able to use our data in uh, making plans to close noise cut. There were plans um, I think in the early 2000s, um, late 90s and early 2000s to close noise cut because of alteration of water flow 
but the money was never spent, so it went away. Um, so this new set kind of allowed this new opportunity allowed us to really collect data um, in hopes that um, the biological data could be used here for the core to fix a mistake that may have been done earlier, um, and then that data again be used in terms of um, other um, navigational issues in um, estuaries up and down the East Coast. Great, thanks Jessica. We'll get back to, to you guys here in a minute. And then finally, I wanna introduce our last panelist uh, for this section. Um, Dr. Nate Neverlink, uh, who's a landscape, landscape ecologist with uh, UGA's Warnell School of Forestry and Natural Resources. Um, Nate's master's is in oceanography and limnology from University of Wisconsin, and he does PhD work in zoology and physiology uh, in Wyoming. And um, we've actually heard from one of the students earlier today, and he referenced uh, Rachel Guy as well, but Nate and students use spatially explicit models to describe um, species environment relationships, forecast species response to environmental changes, and support conservation and manage, uh, management decisions. So certainly all of these are from an integrative approach. And then over the last 10 years, uh, Nate and students have worked increasingly to blend social science with ecological models, um, recognizing the need for multiple perspectives to achieve uh, equitable solutions to conservation problems. And so Nate has served as the director for the Center of Integrative Conservation Research at UGA for seven years and recently accepted the position of Associate Dean at, uh, uh, of Research at Warnell. So Nate, I would say congratulations or my condolences, but ho hopefully <laughs> it's the congratulations piece. So I'll turn it over to you. I'll tell you in a year. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you guys. Thanks, uh, Brian, Tom, Mona. Um, it's been a, it's a pleasure to be invited to speak with all of you. And um, I always have people, uh, when I talk about coastal stuff, introduce my master's degree first because it's in oceanography and limnology, but I sort of pretend to be a marine ecologist because I really wanted to be since I was a child, but I'm really just the GIS guy who has had a, a, some great colleagues and great opportunity to work uh, in coastal systems. Uh, but as Lauren uh, introduced in the speed session, our lab really is focusing on forecasting the influence of sea level rise on estuarine fishes and crustaceans. And this started with Rachel Guy's work and a, and a big USGS grant we got to look at uh, both terrestrial and aquatic species and their potential responses to sea level rise. And a lot of you may know Elizabeth Hunter, who was another important part of that project working on some of the birds down there. What we recognized was that not a whole lot of work had been done um, on the vertebrate species response in particular to uh, some of the forecast changes in marsh structure. Um, and although there are uncertainties around uh, SLAM models and other predictions of what sea level rise is gonna do to the marshes, we do know that the landscape structure, the fragmentation, the patch size, those things will change. Um, so Rachel Guy took the approach of uh, calculating a suite of landscape metrics uh, that were likely to respond uh, both present and in the future. And then we used the juvenile trawl survey that Lauren alluded to early, earlier from the Coastal Resource Division uh, to associate those uh, structure, the localized marsh structure with the abundance and richness of uh, fish and crustaceans. And what we definitely found, there was a strong association in addition to salinity and temperature, there was a strong association of some of these metrics, particularly edge metrics, uh, like edge to area ratios, edge density, uh, with the response of some of these species. So then we could forecast those models into the future based on the sea level rise uh, scenarios from SLAM. And we saw uh, varying levels depending on the scenario of reduction in fish species richness uh, bay anchovy, an important forage uh, fish species, uh, which we talked about earlier. Um, some mixed results with Atlantic croaker and some declines in white shrimp um, among a variety of other uh, responses. And so as Lauren mentioned, her work is really to take a look at some of the longer records, see if they um, are associated with some of the juvenile trawl survey uh, but also recognizing that the juvenile trawl is a fairly short record with respect to seeing some of the longer term 
uh, changes on the coast and understanding what those changes might be. So Lauren hopes to use the Ecopath Ecosim uh, modeling suite to look at really what, say, a 30% reduction in bay anchovy might look like in the future. Uh, just briefly, our new effort, Brainchild uh, from Rachel Guy, is the Estuarine Fish Monitoring Cooperative, uh, which we started last year despite not yet receiving funding for it, but we're submitting a sea grant proposal. Um, the cooperative currently includes Georgia uh, College of Coastal Georgia, Signeer, uh, Warnell Marine Sciences and Marine Extension. And from what I've seen over the last two days, uh, Jessica included, there are lots of potentials to include uh, other partners. The goal of this cooperative is to address the need for curated and shared long-term monitoring data for estuarine nectin, particularly the smaller fishes associated with these marsh complexes while providing training opportunities for future coastal scientists through undergraduate coursework and internships. Again, Jessica, we want to talk to you. <laughs> um, thanks to, you know, long list of thanks, but I'll stop right there so we can have a good discussion. All right. And hopefully, uh, you know, if everybody got a chance to watch the videos and, and hearing all four of our panelists, we, we had, there's some really nice themes about connectivity um, and the integrative approach because um, so obviously when we deal with our fisheries, it's not just the resource itself, there's also the human aspect. And I am going to comment, um, I know Dr. Erica Holman asked a question about the social economic aspects, and I will kind of same thing, I'll tell everybody that I told her, our DEI panel today is actually going to specifically address that. So um, definitely please hold on to that because I think it does tie in of, you know, how this type of research that we're seeing being discussed, you know, that does have an impact on, on communities. Uh, and so I, I will kind of hit the, the human dimension piece in a little bit. Um, Jessica, I will start with you just because I know, and I know you typed your answers already to Clark, but I imagine others might have similar questions. And so um, Clark was asking if, oh, let me go back to that question on that one. Um, Sorry about that. About uh, sediment sediment data. So, was there sediment data, grain size, accumulation rates collected, so that you could later determine uh, dis the sediment dispersal patterns? So, yes, actually, we do. We have five years um, of data for sediment. Um, what we know preliminarily by looking at some of that data is that at our noise cut site and the um, the Piney Bluff site that's, imme that's immediately adjacent and downstream um, from noise cut has the highest amount of silt in clay or smallest sediment size. Um, also what's unique at those two sites is somebody, um, I think Matt was asking about Spartina uh, or the vegetation. We don't, so our data only persists for 2014. We didn't find very much vegetative data um, before um, our um, our biological study, there were some fish studies that were done in the late 80s by CRD um, on the main channel of the Satilla River. So we had some, some idea in terms of fish data, but the vegetation data at Noise Cut and then Piney Bluff, they, and I'm not going to give metrics, it's five feet tall, five feet tall or higher at Noise Cut um, and Piney Bluff node. And you guys know that Spartina, even in tall form, doesn't really get to be five feet tall. Um, so we think it's um, basically just a positive feedback as that flow, that um, double-edged um, or you know, bi-directional flow as a result of noise cut, basically just keeping that sediment in the system. You guys know that Spartina continually slows down the water and it will continually act as a sediment trap. So it's this huge monoculture of, of Spartina in those two sites. Um, we know based on some of the, the um, photos that the landowners have shown um, in terms of um, creek width. And we know that creek width has decreased um, significantly in terms based on those photos because there are some, there are some photos of um, Dover Creek and Umbrella Creek of some of the landowners jet skiing um, on this really wide tidal channel. Um, and you, if you take the picture, um, if you look at that same creek, it's decreased in width by at least you know, 50, 60 feet. Um, so that kind of, so yes, we have sediment data. So small sediment size um, for Clark's um, question. We do have some preliminary metal accumulation data for those sites as well. Um, and what's interesting at Pine, Piney Bluff and Noise Cut, we have um, a high level 
of nickel, um, as well as I want to say lead to I might have to go back and check that data, but that may be associated with those finer um, those finer finer sediment grains. Um, so, and then there was another follow up question about um, what do we expect to happen um, to vegetation um, if, if the, as the core goes through the cut. Um, if you guys listen to um, the last few minutes of the presentation, the core is going forward with their plan to close noise cut. They have been impacted by COVID as well. Um, we're waiting, they're waiting for, I guess, building material to make it down, to be floated down on a barge so that they can begin the closure. Um, it's probably been pushed off to later this year um, or early next year. Um, so we do think that, that as the tidal exchange um, returns, that you may not necessarily see that those really large sands of Spartina. Um, so but that's, you know, that's our best guess in terms of, in terms of what's going on in that area. So I think I, I hope I answered all those <laughs> all the questions that were there. If I didn't, yeah. please. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and that's why we'll have contact information. I mean, hopefully that's that's one of the other goals of this symposium, even virtually, is try to make these connections beyond that. So Matt and Clark, thank you for those questions. Um, just switching real quick, and I know Mark, you responded to Danny's uh, question, but could you question about was about Black Hill uh, current geographic range as well? Does it affect other Pinaid species? So could you comment on that, please? And those famous words we always say, you're, you're muted. Whoops, sorry, thank you. Um, yeah, I'd be glad to talk about that. So we found Black Hill, when we first started, there really wasn't much known about it. Black Hill is really just a symptom, not that not specific to the parasite that's causing it here. Um, and Black Hill is sort of well-known and most well-known in aqua, you know, aquaculture, in ponds, it has high intensity and really the, the black part, the melanized, melanized tissue is just a response to any kind of invader or pathogen. And so that was what we thought black gill was uh, until we looked at the shrimps that had black gill here and realized it was a ciliate. It turned out to be a ciliate that had never been described before. Um, and so that's, that's some of the work that we've been doing. In that process, we started looking around uh, as far as we could, we looked through the Gulf of Mexico in the Atlantic from Florida up, up actually up to Maine. And the distribution is throughout the Gulf of Mexico uh, and up through about the Chesapeake Bay. Um, there is also black gill, very actually uh, large amount of shrimp black gill in the Pandala shrimps uh, in that the, the northern, the red shrimp uh, from, you know, starts in the Gulf of Maine and goes all the way up into the Arctic. Um, but that's caused by a different kind of ciliate, it turns out. So it's everywhere. Um, and then following up on what I was talking about, climate being a driver, if that's really the case, I mean, the climate has been changing, especially the warmer winters, all through the Southeast region. And so we would expect to see, black, if that's the case, black gill happening regionally, not just in, in our area, in our backyard. And in fact, that's very much true. Um, there's just was a study done in, in the Texas shrimp fishery and their rates are now, they were non-existent when we started and now they're even higher than ours are. Um, and Chesapeake Bay, there's a uh, North Carolina is starting a fishery, a shrimp fishery for the first time because the shrimp themselves have been moving north, uh, moving in the Chesapeake Bay. And now we're also seeing black gill emerge uh, as a real uh, significant problem there. So it's uh, as far as we know, in every Panea shrimp that we've looked at, we've seen uh, seen that harbor the, the ciliate that's causing black gill. We call it Halophyza lanai. Um, we've also seen it in some other crustaceans, including the grass shrimp, which might be a, a, a probable estuarine reservoir for it uh, in the winter time, because it seems to go away in Panea shrimp during the winter, visibly, but it's it's somewhere. Thank. You. And you know, just kind of building off what Mark's talking about, and I think all four of you could address this because we again we're talking about environmental changes, whether that's natural or anthropogenic. But John, I'll I'll actually kind of switch over to you, and and maybe Nate, you could also follow up. But because I know again, you're looking at different pathogens, and I think I believe ciliates involved with that. Um, can you talk a little bit, just again, kind of the management applications of what you're looking at, especially as Georgia continues to build its its interest in oyster aquaculture. 
um, not only from the natural resource side, but you know, you talk about this in your your video, even from the the human uh, health side of this as well. Uh, sure. So the two protozoan um, parasites that that cause the the oyster diseases, um, that really would just affect the oysters themselves, and 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 if it and if it is affecting aquaculture, basically the productivity, overall productivity of the leases. Um, in terms of in terms of lower tissue yields and potentially slower growth rates associated with that and potential mortality uh, and and luckily you know knocking on wood we don't really see that here yet and so we hope that maybe there's something about these oysters uh, in Georgia being exposed to high temperatures all the time already that maybe they're a little more adaptable to some of those other stressors uh, the vibrios are, are particularly concerning because. You know, those people get sick uh, when they eat oysters that have those and, and can even die. And for a fledgling oyster industry, uh, you know, a, a death from a Vibrio is certainly going to um, certainly going to create problems for growth of the industry. Um, and so usually we don't harvest in the summer in, in Georgia. Uh, and, and part of the reason for that is to prevent those sorts of uh, issues with the cultured oysters. I, and, and Tom could jump in and, and correct me, but I think the goal is that they, sh they will be harvestable all year long. Now, it depends on handling. You could sort of limit the, the potential risk of Vibrios based on how the oysters are being grown and how they're handled when they're being harvested. Um, but it's still something that we want to see, you know, so, you know, we didn't get to do it last summer and we're hoping to get to do it this summer to sort of link, um, you know, floating versus rack and bag uh, type uh, oyster culture to presence of Vibrio and, and sort of link that to temperature and salinity. Uh, and that's what we're hoping to get out this, this summer in a, in a few weeks. But that would obviously, you know, if, if people start getting sick, you know, eating cultured Georgia oysters, then nobody's going to eat cultured Georgia oysters. So we really want to make sure that that doesn't happen. Yeah, and, yeah John, on. you're right that um, to harvest in the summer, there's strict time control protocols that have to be followed as well as submerged. And so, yeah, it's going to be a, not a burden, but it's going to be more regulated for how the growers that have that want, if they want to harvest over the summer, just to prevent that um, from happening. But I really had a question for Nate, for you and Jessica, because I find it interesting that both Mark and John are looking at you know invertebrates that are seeing impacts from ciliates that are causing potential or impacts to their population. Are you guys seeing anything in your fish collections that are pointing to anything on the horizons with disease or changes in that respect? Can't unmute myself, sorry. <laughs> I, was gonna, I was just gonna say, Jessica, you're welcome to go first. I'll, I'll go very quickly. Um, Rachel Guy would probably be the best person to answer that question, or possibly even Brian, you've been out pretty recently. Um, I, I haven't seen anything. I don't, I, you know, it didn't turn up as a major component of Rachel's dissertation work that I recall. Um, uh, but, you know, there are probably better people to speak to that than myself. Jessica? So we really haven't either. Um, we could probably, I mean, in terms of abiotic factors, I could tell you whether the temperature has changed. We I mean, we've, we have a lot of water quality data that we're still mining. Um, so um, in terms of temperature, we could. Um, one of the side projects that um, was a part of this recent CIG grant was actually microsporidian um, and hepatopancreas of white shrimp. Um, so we had an undergrad um, who was looking for the prevalence of microsporidian infection. Um, we don't, we don't, I don't have any background data in terms of this system, whether there's an increase of microsporidium or not. Um, so, but that would be something that we could use at least with this data, but I don't, I don't have anything off the top of my head in terms of what we've seen um, in, um, at least with our system. And Mark, you had your end race too to, to add into. Yeah, if I could just add, I think that the, we, we have a really a gap in knowledge because we don't know what we're looking for oftentimes. And for example, in shrimp, we took, we looked at 13 shrimp we caught over a year and we found just of the, the um, eukaryotic uh, potential pathogens, 200 groups of organisms there 
that potentially could be pathogens. And I think that's out there. Um, and that's certainly true for bacteria and especially true for viruses, for things, for uh, vertebrates. Um, and for example, what happened to the catfish here? There's a, they just disappeared. Uh, there's a teeny, teeny, teeny little bit of evidence that it was a virus that wiped them out, but they are really gone now. And they used to be in every trawl that we did in the 90s, full of those, you know, those catfish. They're gone now. So I think that there's a huge, and that's what we need to be doing in the future. Or now we need to be doing the surveillance, uh, sort of these sort of general, maybe genetic surveillances for potential, uh, you know, new disease agents, because there is going to be another one that's going to wreak havoc. And we're going to be in the same place we are with something like Blackdale. It takes us we don't even know what it is. And everybody's got crazy ideas about what it is and what's causing it. And it takes research years and years to sleuth that stuff out. Um, and that's too late. So I think it's a, that's a really good point. That the, you know, what is the risks of emerging diseases is in, in across the spectrum? Plants too. You know, we still don't know that the marsh dieback wasn't due to, due to some kind of pathogen, really. Margo, no, no. I want to come back to that because you know you're kind of uh, getting at some of that end users because I think every all all four of you talked and then you know Matt Kenworthy today talked about you know working with anglers to help them and and so I want to come back to that about the the impacts on end users whether that's management you know anglers uh, researchers I do want to point out um, there was a question um, and I just want to go back to what John was talking about the safety piece of it that I, uh, Mark did add about was shrimp. And this is a good example when people would first started coming out about the safety of eating shrimp with black gill. And Mark, you just want to repeat what you had put out there, just that fact, because we got that question a lot. Yeah. So just as John said that there's no hum risk to humans if you eat dermo or, you know, there is no effect to humans if, if of the black, of the par eating the parasite that causes uh, black gill. None. Mm -hmm. And, and really yeah. specific to shrimp too, as well. We're not seeing effects in crabs or even though it might even be there in other species, it seems to be something with pinnated shrimp, very specific. And there's kind of going back to the theme of kind of the, the safety and then the, the protocols, Tom, I just, and Mark had asked about, could you just touch base off the summer study? I believe you're gonna be involved with, with CRD, just give an update. There we go. Well, Elliot, you're talking about our Vibrio sampling next year. Yeah, so next year to address some of the Vibrio and that will pair well with what John's doing is also, um, we're hoping to, if the permits go through, to look at um, cultured oysters in two types of floating gear um, near where the new leases are coming up, specifically for Vibrio to evaluate it for the time temperature for the state's um, VP plan that they have to have on file with the FDA. Um, so that will be kicking in next summer if all goes well. And so that will pair well with what John's going to be starting up this year. So yeah, very excited to see that. And John, we also had a question earlier on from um, Sandy wanting to know where all your locations were going to be that you're going to be testing for Vibrio. Yeah, so we, with the archive samples, we're, we're able to go back and, and still screen those. So we've collected samples uh, in, in basically four of the public picking areas, um, uh, Oyster Creek, Medway River, um, Tea Kettle Creek, and Jointer Creek. Uh, so we've got samples from there. Uh, we're also going to be doing um, the, the Vibrio screening experiment uh, on Sapelo Island um, at the Hunt Camp and uh, Cabretta Creek because those are the most different in terms of salinity. And so uh, we expect salinity to play a pretty important role in, uh, in these uh, as well as temperature. So, um, so we'll be having our basically every two weeks sampling to sort of track you know, the, the prevalence and intensity and try to link that to those, those two variables uh, on Sapelo Island. We've also sampled other areas along the coast, um, but they aren't, they aren't um, uh, harvest areas, but we've, we've sampled around Skidaway Island a couple of spots, for example. So, Nate, I'm going to transition a little bit to you. We're, and, you know, we've heard modeling mentioned several times and, um, you know, collaboration. 
where, where are you seeing some gaps or some needs in, you know, as a special ecologist as, it, the, as in the context for fisheries, where are you seeing some needs on the Georgia coast where, you know, even through these conversations might be able to, to, to help fill some of that in from, from some of the work that you've already talked about and some of the, some of the work that you're seeing. Yeah. Well, obviously, uh, you know, from, from what I prepared for today, one of the, one of the biggest needs I think is, is monitoring. And we always say that, um, but reflecting again off of what Mark said, um, you know, there may be an opportunity as we begin some of these monitoring programs to to consider some of these other things that might be worth tracking, whether it's uh, collecting a certain amount of voucher specimens or th things that could be retroactively looked at. As, as Mark was talking, I was reflecting on the fact that we are seeing a decline in diversity uh, that is predicted um, to, to go forward with sea level rise. And and we, or, or I should just say richness. Um, and one thing we just didn't, haven't had time to look into yet is which, which are those species that are dropping out of that pool uh, over time and, um, you know, and what are the causes? And reflecting on something, again, Mark said even earlier than that, with that, we need more work on these mechanisms. Um, but a foundation for this is that, is, a, is an effective monitoring program. And I think, we're missing uh, these smaller body fishes in these Mars complexes, but there's a, you know, this is just a shameless plug again for the, for the cooperative, but hearing what I've heard over the last couple of days, there's a lot of people out there doing both formal and informal sampling efforts that if data was pooled uh, and properly vetted, put together in a shared database, um, I think there would be a, a way to take advantage of more of what we're all doing down there uh, to answer some of the questions that require longer term records um, and the the and the variability across the different site types. Um, and one thing that we still lack, um, and I'll admit don't have a really solid plan for yet for our cooperative is the habitat data. Uh, we're we're optimistic we're going to get uh, some of the broader scale stuff from ongoing LIDAR surveys and such. Um, but what do we need in the field? It usually takes a long time to collect. What are the most important characteristics? Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know if that spoke to some of the gaps, but I'll stop there and see if anyone else has anything else to add. Yeah, Jessica or anyone else I'm just care to jump in on that? I was just going to echo that definitely it definitely needs to be a, a broad scale type um, monitoring effect. I mean, we're, we're all um, experts on something, but, you know, um, in hopes that you could, you know, partner up with somebody and then create that big picture. Um, just adding on to what Nate said, I think is really, really important. Okay. Good deal. Um, and Mark, I'm going to have you kind of already answer your question that Danny asked about the, about knowing, uh, do we know if the diseases that you're isolating are the primary and not, or how do you know that they're not the primary, that they're the primary, not the secondary infection? We absolutely do not know the answer to that question. Okay. Hard, hard to disentangle those. And, you know, you'd really have to do experiments to, to work that out or do very large scale sampling and statistically sort it out. Uh, none of that has been done. It just, we know so little, you know, Think, think about, think of, I like to, to say this when I'm giving lectures and talking with students, especially if you took all the diseases known about humans, okay, it fills libraries. If you took all the diseases that we know about, say, uh, cows and chickens, it fills a small room, okay? If you take all the data that we know about, all, especially all these small fishes and things we don't study about, I can put it in one volume or maybe two. That's how little we know. And yet every organism is, there's no reason why it doesn't have as many diseases and uh, you know, genetic diversities and pharmaco, all of that as do humans. And so it's just astounding how little we know about this, that, that, that issue. Really, it's humbling. And yet these don't happen in isolation and have impacts at the population level, community level, human. So it's a good point. Um, there was a, a follow-up question, and uh, and I'll let 
number of you answered this possibly, but it said during an NSF project, uh, this is from Marshall, um, during a uh, NSF project between 2006 and 2008, the Tiller River observed a huge shift in sediment biogeochemical processes during the 2007 drought that we had, uh, indicating salinity changes associated with low freshwater discharge uh, was affecting sediment microbial communities. And so I'm wondering uh, if you think that such variations in sediment biogeochemistry may affect shrimp, crab, oyster, or other species that would be important to our fisheries here in Georgia. So salinity connection, what do we, I see Jessica nodding, so I'm gonna let her answer first. Nate, I thought you unmuted yourself first, so I was gonna let you, I was gonna let you go. Um, so I, obviously I'm just, this is general speaking, but um, yes, it, and the simple answer is probably yes. I, I've read some data. Um, I've only been in Georgia since 2010, but there was drought that affected both, and Mark can probably um, add on this too, is that there was drought along both the South Carolina and Georgia coast during 20, late 2010 too, that also affected both blue crab um, and white, then the shrimp industry. So anytime there was that change in salinity and uh, riverine input into the system, that's definitely going to affect those fisheries, um, um, especially the settlement patterns. Go ahead, Mark. I mean, I, that, I mean, based on uh, no, my I, 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 I expand, I, I wrote a response in the question and answer, but about the blue crabs, I can be even more specific about that. The salinity <laughs> increases associated with a drought triggered a, a, a sort of epidemic of a parasitic dinoflagellate called hematidinium, and that's what wiped out. That That is such a nasty parasite, it kills crabs right away. And so it was easy to make that connection. And that was very much a, a salinity driven. And in the Chesapeake Bay, if you look on the inner, inner side and the outer side where there's a big difference of, in salinity, Jeff Shields and his group at VIMS have definitely, and Gretchen Messick and all of those people have definitely shown a, a salinity effect on the really the how pathogenic this parasitic dinoflagellate infection is. And so absolutely, Marshall, uh, Michelle, it's salinity is a one of those master drivers, environmental drivers that very much has, you know, really broad effects and mostly unpredictable. You absolutely had economic impacts, you know, repercussions from that on, on the industry. Um, Nate, a question uh, from Matt, just um, and, and I'll kind of open this up to Jessica, too. Just curious, but it said, uh, you seeing any tropical species starting to show up in any of the data sets uh, indicating potential rain shifts? Oh boy, that's another good one for Rachel. I have nothing, I haven't seen anything dominant. Um, if, if Rachel's here, she could maybe throw something in the chat uh, from stuff that she's been seeing, but Jessica shook her head, so I'll let you chime in. <laughs> It's only been, and it's only been a few here and there. They've been just, you know, showing up and they've, um, most of our occurrences, they were a couple of snapper species that we wouldn't necessarily see predominantly here. And it was usually after hurricane sampling. Uh, the water, you know, you guys know, all know how, you know, hurricanes will bring stuff in. Um, and especially during our years, we were one year, the first year we were affected by Matthew and then Irma and Maria. Um, and some of those months early, I think we had a couple of species, tropical species of goby that we got while trawling. Um, but other than that, nothing um, um, in terms of long term rain shift that we're seeing, you know, season after season. Um, but I know that there's been some work done on mangrove crabs just been, you know, and I know they're starting to push their way northern Florida into southern Georgia. And I think I want to say mangrove crabs have been found as far north as the Satilla River um, and maybe farther north, but um, and there's some suggestion that they're getting there before the mangroves. So, um, but that's, you know, that's all, at least with our data. And I know, so we've got about 10 minutes. Hold on, Mark, I saw you raise your hand, but I know there's others in the group because, you know, some of the monitoring at Gray's Reef. I thought Danny Gleason has talked about this before too, but. Anybody else in the in the call, please add if you have any of your data sets where you've seen that, you know, those species, please let us know. And 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 that question of the mangroves definitely has come up before. I, yeah, to see what if, you know, and of course, you know, Jessica, you mentioned hurricanes and so more of these short, you know, short-term events with large impacts versus what Nate and John, I've heard you mention and all of you today are these more long-term trends. 
and trying to sift these out to figure out, you know, a lot of times we want direct black and white causes and, and we know that, you know, that can be a challenge. So Mark, you had your hand uh, raised just to comment on that too. Oh, I just, I just think if Jeb Byers is still on oh. this, he would uh, have a lot to add, I think about Caribbean creep. Yeah, I was also curious, Nate and Jessica and John and Mark as well. In addition to range extension, you know, tropical species, have you seen any increase in any exotic species or non-native showing up in any of your sampling? Because I know for a while we had the green mussel show up quite routinely. It's not as much lately, but in all your sampling have any exotics popped up? Once again, I'd have to defer to Rachel. It's been it's been five years since we <laughs> since we looked at that at those data sets together. Um, other than the other than the dominant species, which uh, which I spoke about, um, so uh, yeah, I'd have to I'd have to dig back into the data to check that out. But again, nothing dominant or super surprising that kind of caught us off guard, such that we needed a conversation about it. So, and if you didn't. Yeah, and just uh, Kim Robertson, thank you from from Gray's Reef. Just mentioned that you know Gray's Reef starting to see some tropicals, but mostly in the summer months, and they're working with the uh, Beaufort Lab up in North Carolina on that. So thank you for adding that that piece. Um, yeah, I just I I mean I I don't really see a lot of this stuff where where we're working. I mean you know obviously we get a lot of the porcelain crabs. I know there's some debate about. Um, what you want to call them, um, because they've always been, you know, in the United States, they're just making their way farther up north. Some people want to call it an, an invasive, but it's probably just an expander. Um, but other than that, you know, I've only seen the green mussel once or twice out on, on Tybee Island at the pier, so not even on a natural substrate. I wonder if some of the skip Georgia too, because we don't really have the the kind of juvenile fish habitat for a lot of the tropical fish, which is seagrass. We don't have any of that in Georgia. We don't have the right kind of conditions. So, um, because I know, and Matt, who asked the question, has probably seen them show up when he was in North Carolina. So I think, you know, I think a lot of those species, because we don't have the right conditions in terms of our estuaries being deep and, and soft bottomed and no, and no seagrasses, that we might not see them, even if they drifted in with as larvae. That would be my thought. Gotcha. Um, so we've got, it's, I think we've got about seven minutes. And I noticed Rachel Guy did comment about regular seeing mangrove crabs up at Siner. And then, um, you know, of course, tiger shrimp too, we have seen and definitely reports from shrimpers and not even on the back, just back of the decks, but we've had reports of even cast netting, um, you know, up in the sounds of seeing juvenile, which, you know, have been more isolated incidents. But um, I do want to touch back because both the Sea Grant research and the CIG research, you know, the, the applied aspects are really important. And I think Clark mentioned this yesterday. I think it's really important. When you talk, you know, can you guys talk a little bit more about, you know, especially whether it's directly involved with stakeholders or where you see um, this benefiting the research that you're doing right now? And it could be it could be the fishing industry, but it could be. DNR, it could be, you know, other researchers. Can you just talk a little bit about how, you know, how you see your research fitting into that applied piece and, and you know, the potential benefits of that? And I'm going to open it up to everybody on that one, because I figure you probably could all touch on base on it. I can go real quick. I, I, I think um, the, the biggest piece we're focused on right now is resourcing researchers and getting more into making sure that we're training. Uh, we want to be training the next generation. We want to make sure that the old white bald guy representation in this is balanced when and I'm encouraged over the last few days that uh, the, 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 what we're seeing here is changing in a good way. Um, and so, so our focus is really on, uh, on that at the moment. Um, not that we don't, you know, the applied aspect of this work, I think, is critical. We want to, that's why we want to move into the food web modeling. That's why we want to be able to project what these changes might mean for the fishery itself. Um, to, and we're looking for those threshold points, like how, like what would have to happen to the forage base to see a significant impact on a, a recreationally or commercially important species. Um, and uh, so, so we're really interested in getting to that point uh, with our work, but that's where I'll stop for now. 
I'm, I'm looking at Dr. R, so I'm going to put it in the context of your students there. So, um, I guess I, I don't know. With our project, it was kind of multifaceted. So, in hopes um, with the data that we collected, since there really wasn't a lot of you know biological data, with the exception of you know some some surveys here and there that we could really supply the stakeholders like DNR, CRD, some really good quality data. Um, on the undergrad, you know, because you know, I, we deal primarily with undergrads, um, I was hoping to be able to get students excited to become those stakeholders. And then the, the third part of our um, project was actually working with the landowners. I'll, I have to say that that was probably the most unique part of our project. They were um, volunteers for us for seven years. And we're not talking about young guns. We're talking about guys who are old enough to be your grandfather. Every, you know, once a month on a Saturday, they would take us out for four hours on the Satilla River and they would learn from us. So, I mean, I, so that was kind of nice, but they have become our extended family. So it kind of, there's more support there that you can have a really good relationship with landowners and be a scientist at the same time. I know it's very rare and it doesn't always work out that way, but this was obviously a very unique opportunity. So, and, and I think by working from all those facets, you do create um, a more informed community, stakeholders, you know, training the next generation of marine scientists, and then also having an informed community. And I think when everybody's informed, then that, you know, helps the fisheries themselves. Great. John, you want to add to that and then wrap up, Mark, see in the last three minutes? Um, I, I can add that I was getting a text from my student, and so I don't even know what question we're answering. <laughs> we'll just, since we're almost out of time, I'll just let Mark uh, wrap us up. So, yeah, I just following up on Jessica's comments, and that comments the place I started when I introduced our project is that I think especially in the dynamic uh, times that we're living in, it's really no longer possible for all of us to be in silos. And so the efforts of, you know, working with these different stakeholders and, and homeowners and the fishery and management, you know, being nimble is requiring us to do that more and more and that will help everybody. And I think that's in all projects that we do, those kind of partnerships need to be fostered and, and developed. Uh, and that will be extremely beneficial. Perfect. Um, Tom, any other last words or thoughts, something you've picked up from our panelists? No, I just really appreciate you all taking the time and um, giving us your insights and thoughts about things. And it's uh, been very interesting. So thank you. So, um, with that, we'll, we've got a minute or two for the biological break, um, but I kind of want to end where we start off with and, you know, going from a lot of the work that's being done here on that ecological biological side, you know, this next panel that we're going to be going into or one of our uh, second DEI panels um, is going to touch on that the socioeconomic aspect. So, I mean, all this research that's being done, it isn't being done in a vacuum and it does have impacts on our on our fisheries at the community level and individual. So, uh, we've got some phenomenal uh, panelists coming up for the next session. And with that, Mona, I'm going to turn it back over to you uh, and give our next directions. Thank you so much to all the panelists. Uh, once again, if we were in one room, uh, everybody would be applauding at this point of time. That was uh, incredibly insightful, everyone. And thank you, Tom and Brian, for all your hard work in putting this together. 